learners, welcome to NIOA studio. I, Dr. Gargi Kaur Majumdar, would like to talk about biosphere today. The objectives of this session is to study the mechanisms stabilizing and controlling global climate, to identify the causes of climate changes, to define the key concepts like global warming, ozone layer, depletion, acid rain and sustainable development, to highlight the efforts made to cope with it at global and local level to explain the need and importance of sustainable development. Let's have a look at the biosphere. Now let's talk about the global climate changes. The earth has a unique mechanism for stabilizing and controlling the global climate. These mechanisms are as follows. The plants and animals balance carbon dioxide level of the atmosphere, which in turn act as a global climate thermostat. It means these elements control the temperature balance within optimum limits. This is the picture of a mechanism of global climate. The water bodies play important role in regulating global climate. In recent years, the rapid growth of human population, the rate at which we consume the Earth's resources, extravagant lifestyles, etc., led to a substantial increase in carbon level of atmosphere, which has accelerated the process of climatic change. Now let's talk about greenhouse effects and global warming. Global warming refers to a gradual rise of atmospheric temperature and consequent changes in the radiation balance mainly due to human action leading to climatic change at different levels, local, regional and global. As per recent estimates, it has been found that the surface air temperature over the past 100 years has increased by about 0.50 centigrade to 0.70 centigrade. This is a picture of a greenhouse effect, how the greenhouse effects work in cities particularly. Do you know why it is happening? This is due to greenhouse effect. To have a better understanding about global warming, we should know the functioning of a greenhouse. In a cold country, a greenhouse is meant for plants where total heat is especially during winter season is not sufficient to support plant growth. The transparent walls and roof of the greenhouse are such that these allow the visible sunlight to enter but prevent the long waved radiations to go out. Thus, the sunlight is absorbed by the soil and structure of the greenhouse. This is a look at the greenhouse. You must have seen this in uh, cold areas or in hilly areas. It is then re-emitted as heat which cannot pass through the glass. The amount of energy in the greenhouse is thus increases until its temperature is high enough for the slight leakage of heat through the glass to take away as much energy as gets in as sunlight. Subsequently, walls and roof re-emit absorbed radiation into the house. Thus, during the daytime, infrared radiation pass into greenhouse and warm the atmosphere and the ground on which the greenhouse stands. Coating of glass with a non-heat radiation film transparent to sunlight further maximizes heating effect of the radiation. Let's have a discussion about the greenhouse effect. Therefore, if our earth has become a greenhouse, then there are certain gases which acts like the glass panels of a greenhouse, allowing the sun's rays to pass through, but preventing the heat from escaping into the outer space and there by warming the atmosphere. Now, what are the sources of greenhouse? This is happening due to deforestation and industrialization. These gases are carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxygen oxides and chlorofluorocarbon and hence known as greenhouse gases. Out of these four gases, carbon dioxide contributes about 55% of chlorofluorocarbon contributes about 25%, methane and uh, contribute about 15% and nitrous oxide about 6% towards heating of the atmosphere. Do you know the sources of these gases? like burning of fossil fuels and the firewoods, large fleet of automobiles and number of factories emit carbon dioxide. Growing paddies, livestock, waste dumps and coal mining are the major sources of methane. The use of aerosols as coolants in the refrigerators and air conditioning devices releases chlorofluorocarbons into the atmosphere. Now what are the sources of greenhouse? You can see, look at this picture. One is the vehicular pollution and the other one is factory pollution. Nitrous oxide is mainly emitted from chemical industries and due to deforestation and certain agricultural practices. Construction of greenhouses in temperate region helps in plant protection and ecological balances. 
whereas concentration of greenhouse gases on the Earth's atmosphere upsets the Earth's biological system. What are the consequences of greenhouse effect then? It is estimated that if the present rate of increase in CO2 level continues, it will result in rise of atmospheric temperature by 20 degrees centigrade to 30 degrees centigrade by the end of 21st century. This will result in receding many glaciers. Have a look at this picture. Melting of ice caps in the polar regions and disappearance of deposits of ice on the other parts of the world in a large scale. According to an estimate, if all the ice on the earth would melt, about 60 meters of water would be added to the surface of all oceans and low-lying coastal areas. A rise in sea level of only 50 to 100 centimeters caused by global warming would flood low-lying areas of the world, such as Bangladesh, West Bengal, as well as densely populated coastal cities from Shanghai to San Francisco. Because of increased concentration of CO2 and due to much warmer tropical oceans, there may occur more cyclones and hurricanes. Early snow melt in mountains will cause more floods during monsoon. According to United Nations Environment Programme, which is UNEP, within about three decades, rising levels of seas will be able to and, uh, flood coastal cities like Bombay, Boston, Chittagong and Manila. A slight increase in global temperature can adversely affect the world food production. Thus, the wheat production zones in the northern latitude will be shifted to north of temperate latitudes. The biological productivity of the ocean would also decrease due to warming of the surface layer, which in turn reduces the transport of nutrient from deeper layers to the surface by vertical circulation. The following measures may be adopted to reduce the ever-increasing greenhouse effect. First, CO2 concentration can be reduced by drastic cut in the consumption of fossil fuels in the highly developed and industrialized countries like United States of America, Japan, and developing countries like China and India. Second, scientific efforts should be made to develop alternative efficient fuels. Methane may be a substitute for petroleum. Development of hydroelectric and thermal powers are better alternatives. Then there should be a restriction on the emission of dangerous CO2 CFCs and as NO2 from the factories and automobiles. Limiting the driving days in mega cities can be another option. Cities like Singapore and Mexico are following the practice. In tropical and subtropical countries, the solar energy may be developed as an alternative to the fossil fuels. Biogas plants should be used, which is another source of conventional energy for domestic use. Enhancing afforestation will certainly reduce the carbon dioxide level, thereby decreasing the greenhouse effect. Now let's talk about ozone layer. Ozone is a form of oxygen that has three atoms, rather than the more common two atoms, O2. It is created in the upper atmosphere by the action of solar radiation on oxygen molecules. As far as its position is concerned, it is found in the form of a thin layer in the stratosphere between 15 to 48 km. About 90% of all the atmospheric ozone is found in this layer. Ozone constitutes only less than 0.002% of the volume of the atmosphere. However, its role is very critical as far as lives on the Earth is concerned. It strongly absorbs ultraviolet radiation or UV rays from the Sun. Ultraviolet radiation is biologically destructive in many ways. It causes skin cancer, cataracts, suppresses the human immune system, diminishes the yield of many crops. Then chlorofluorocarbons are also there, which disrupts the aquatic food chain by killing microorganisms on the ocean surface and many other negative effects which is still undiscovered. This is happening due to certain recent human activities which have injected certain chemicals in the stratosphere, which consume ozone and re reduces its concentration. Depletion is mainly caused by chlorofluorocarbons, halons, methyl, chloroform, and carbon tetrachlorides. What are the effects of CFCs? These chemical substances are mainly either uh, chlorine or bromine, which can reach the stratosphere and catalytically break down ozone into oxygen. CFCs are odorless, non-flammable, non-corrosive, and non-toxic. For this reason, scientists originally believed CFCs could not possibly have any effect on the environment. That is why it is widely used in refrigeration and air conditioning 
in foam and plastic manufacturing and in aerosol sprays. Not only is the ozone layer thinning, this in some places it has temporarily disappeared. A hole in the layer has developed over Antarctic since 1979 and the hole has persisted for a longer and longer time every year. In 1988, an ozone hole was found over the Arctic for the first time and it too has lasted longer and longer each year since then. It needs certain actions both at individual as well as government level. Since the last two decades, certain actions have been initiated at global level. Among these, Montreal Protocol of 1987 and London Conference of 1992 are important. In both these conferences, it was decided that the developed countries would totally ban CFC production by 2000 and the developing countries by 2010 AD. Even if it is sincerely followed and strictly implemented by all the 150 countries, including India, who are signatory to Montreal Protocol, even then the chlorofluorocarbon and chlorine shall continue their influence for another 100 years. Therefore, all over the world, research efforts are continuing for development of substitutes of CFCs as coolants for refrigeration and air conditioners. The term acid drain. Now, what does it mean? It refers to the deposition of wet or dry acidic materials from the atmosphere of the Earth's surface. Although most conspicuously associated with rainfall, the pollutants may fall on Earth's surface either in the form of snow, sleet, hail, or fog, or in the dry form of gases or particulate matter. Sulfuric acid and nitric acid are considered as the principal agents responsible for acid rain. But the major culprits are human beings. This is a pictorial representation of acid rain. Smokes emitted from the industries is the major source of sulfur dioxide, whereas smokes emitted from the motor vehicles is the major source of nitrogen oxide. These emissions mixed with atmospheric moisture from the sulfuric acid and nitric acids which sooner or later precipitate on the earth in various forms. Acidity is measured on a pH scale based on the relative concentration of hydrogen ions. The scale ranges from 0 to 14, where the lower end represents extreme acidity and the upper end extreme alkalinity. There is a diagram uh, after this, you can have a look at it. As stated earlier, acid rain is associated with various forms of precipitation. If you look at rainfall in clean and dust-free air, a pH value varies between 5.6 to 6, which is slightly acidic in nature. Whenever or wherever the pH value is below 5.6, then the damage becomes noticeable. This is the diagram I was talking about that shows the pH scale. The long-term effects of acid precipitation on human health and agriculture production have not yet been ascertained precisely. However, the most conspicuous damage is being done to aquatic ecosystem. The ecosystem of a stream or lake may be severely affected when, it is pH, when its pH falls below 5. Total biomass in such system is reduced from 2 to 10 times because few orga organisms can tolerate acid. The diversity of species also decreases. The most severe effect of acidification is on fish. Acidic conditions affect the reproductive capabilities of fish, resulting in a slow decline of fish population. This has been documented in various parts of Europe and North America. In Norway, thousands of lakes and streams have largely lost their fish population over an area of 33,000 square kilometer. What are other impacts of acid rain? Several lakes in eastern United States and Canada have become biologically deserts during the last quarter century. The precise effects of acid rain on forests are not clearly understood. Evidence, however, shows that it is responsible for forest dieback, which is occurring in each continent. This picture shows the forest dieback. Forest dieback is a German word which means death or decline of forest. Even buildings and monuments are being destroyed because acid deposition accelerated erosion capacity. Acid rain is a serious global problem and its impact can spread over long distances from the origin of the pollutant. That is why Scandinavian countries complain about British pollution in Europe, whereas Canadians blame United States and North America. Now let's talk about sustainable development, which is very much required in today's time. Today, the world has made a lot of progress. 
human beings with the help of technological advancement and consumption of energy resources have made many inventions and discoveries to make their life more and more comfortable. At present, without technology and mineral and power resources, we cannot think about the life. It has entered into a large scale in almost every sector, be it agriculture, industry, transport, communication and domestic. Even the situation is such that our ecology is in danger. If we continue in this fashion, most of the minerals and power resources will be consumed within next 100 years. Simultaneously, it has affected and endangered four components of the ecosphere. These are the climatic systems, the hydrological cycles, the nutrient cycle and the biodiversity. The situation has worsened to that extent that the resources which are considered renewable become non-renewable. Let us explain this with one example. Take the case of Yamuna water in Delhi. Take the case of Yamuna water. We have polluted the water to such an extent that this water cannot be consumed despite treatment. Same is the case with air, soil, etc. Due to careless and selfish action of human beings, these natural resources are degraded to such an extent that it becomes non-renewable. A conscious effort was made to address this particular problem. A committee was formed by United Nations in Brundtland, known as United Nations Commission on Environment and Development or popularly Brundtland Commission. The title of the report prepared by Commission is Our Common Future. In the beginning, the world was divided into two groups, developed and developing countries, and each started blaming each other. The developed countries blamed developing countries for the rapid population growth, poverty and primitive, primitive technology, which leads to pollution. The arguments of the developing countries was that extravagant lifestyles of developed countries puts a lot of pressure on existing resources. But after a lot of heated discussions and arguments, it was felt that there should be some common grounds in which all the world should agree to protect it for future. It was felt that there should be a balance between ecology, economics and technology. Therefore, Brundtland Commission defines sustainable development as meeting the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generation to meet their own needs. Some strategies are given below for achieving sustainable development. First, reviving growth. Sustainable development must address the issue of poverty. Poverty increases pressure on the environment by following lifestyles that degrade environment. For example, forest cutting for fuel use or expanding deserts by overgrazing activities. At the same time, they are helpless as they do not have alternative sources of livelihood. Majority of people living below poverty lines are found in Africa and Asia. Efforts should be made to provide them certain alternatives like skills, training, education, etc. so that they can earn livelihood and come out of poverty. Otherwise, the very purpose of sustainability or sustainable development will be more fated, will be forfeited. Because as long as poverty will be there, poor people will depend upon nature for their survival. Other options are ensuring a sustainable level of population. Today, one of the major challenges is to tackle the highest rate of population growth, especially in Africa, South Asia and Middle East. Explosion of population has direct link with quality of life. Parameters like accesses to education, health, housing, safe drinking water, sanitation and means of livelihood. It puts a lot of stress on government to provide additional facilities when population is increasing rapidly. Other option is meeting essential human needs. This is a prerequisite for reviving growth. It is evident that unless the basic needs are satisfied, the individual cannot participate in growth process. Essential human needs include enough food, adequate housing, fresh water supply, and health facilities. More food and quality food should be provided because this is not just to feed people, but to attack undernourishment and to develop immune system for preventing diseases. There is a need to change the orientation of growth. When we say growth, we always mean economic growth or materialistic growth. But there is a need for making growth less materialistic, less energy intensive and more equitable. Economic and social development have to be mutually reinforcing. In other words, 
economic development should pay attention towards better social development like education, health, sanitation, etc. Simultaneously, social development can boost the economy of the areas, region and country. Conserving and enhancing resource base is another option. We have to conserve resources in a sustainable manner without jeopardizing the growth and equal access to resources for livelihood. There is also a need to find out alternatives to non-renewable resources, more efficient use of resources, discovery of new resources and discovery of low-waste technologies. Orientation of technology can be done in two principal ways. First, the capacity for innovation needs to be greatly enhanced in developing countries. Second, the effort by developed countries must play a vital role as far as the transfer of technology is concerned. Therefore, all the technological development must pay greater attention to environmental factors and related risk. Last but not the least, economics and ecology should not be seen in opposition but as interlocking. Sustainable development requires the unification of economics and ecology in international relations. Now let's have a quick recap. Biosphere as the largest ecosystem remained undisturbed for billion years. But in recent years, due to adverse human actions, a lot of damage has been made and some of these are irreversible, such as global warming, ozone layer depletion, acid rain, etc. Today, at the global level, initiatives have been taken to address these problems. One of the significant development was United Nations Commission on Environment and Development and the concept of sustainable development which was brought forward. Some of the strategies for sustainable development include revising growth, meeting essential human needs, ensuring a sustainable level of population, merging environment, economics and decision-making processes. I hope you learnt. Thank you listeners for listening to me patiently. Hope this session was fruitful. Good luck.